You've probably played the game Angry Birds. In the game, you use a slingshot to launch a wingless bird. The initial velocity and the initial angle of the launch will determine the trajectory of the bird. This movement is an example of projectile motion, which also happens to be an example of a second order differential equation. Can we use the differential equations.jl package to solve these types of problems in Julia? Well, let's find out. Welcome to doco.jl, where I explore the vast Julia wilderness and turn my discoveries into wholesome Julia tutorials. I'm assuming that you've watched the first five episodes of this series, so I'm assuming that you know how to use Pluto Notebooks and that you know the basics of the Julia programming language. I'm also assuming that you know how to use the differential equations.jl package in order to solve simple ordinary differential equations. With that said, let's get started. Let's start by firing up the Julia REPL and launching Pluto. Next, let's create a new notebook and title it Projectile Motion. This is optional, but I'm going to customize this user interface like I did in the first tutorial. Let's save this file by using the Save Notebook bar at the top. Next, let's add a few packages. Now that everything's loaded, let's describe the problem that we're trying to solve. Before we get to the definition of a second order differential equation, let's talk about the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. Let's say that u is the function that defines the position of an object. If we want to understand how the position changes over time, then we would take the derivative of position with respect to time. The derivative of position with respect to time is also known as the velocity. So that makes sense, right? Meters per second and miles per hour are examples of how we measure velocity, since they describe how the position changes over time. We haven't been using this term, but this derivative is also known as a first order differential equation. The term first order means that the derivative is only taken once. You can also take a first order derivative of velocity with respect to time. The derivative of velocity with respect to time is also known as acceleration. Meters per second per second is an example of how to measure acceleration since it describes how the velocity changes over time. By convention, meters per second per second is written as meters per second squared. So if acceleration is the derivative of velocity over time, and velocity is the derivative of position over time, then acceleration is really just taking the derivative of position over time, twice. Bruh. So that's what a second order differential equation is. It's a derivative of a derivative, and it's written using this convention. This notation for a second order differential equation is a bit confusing, but all this really means is that it's a derivative of a derivative. You'll be happy to learn that the differential equations.jl package can solve second order ordinary differential equations. 
The differential equations.jl package expects second order ordinary differential equations to be a Julia function that takes four arguments, the u, u, p, and t. You've seen u, p, and t before, where u is the unknown function that we're trying to understand. The u is the first derivative of u. So in our example, u is position, and du is velocity. This function will return the second derivative of position, which is acceleration. In the case of the projectile motion problem, we need to be aware that movement is happening in two dimensions. In order to account for this, we need to track activity in both the horizontal direction as well as activity in the vertical direction. As a result, we need to express the position, velocity, and acceleration as separate vectors, each containing a horizontal, or x component, and a vertical, or y component. For projectile motion in the horizontal direction, the acceleration is zero, but in the vertical direction, the acceleration is called the gravitational acceleration. According to the Wikipedia article on gravitational acceleration, in physics, gravitational acceleration is the acceleration of an object in free fall within a vacuum, and thus without experiencing drag. So this is important. For this example, we're going to model a theoretical world without any atmosphere. So we won't be taking into account any pesky real-world conditions like air resistance, wind movement, curvature of the Earth, or rotation of the Earth. Also, since this pristine theoretical world is in a vacuum, the mass and the shape of the object doesn't matter. All objects in this theoretical world will travel at the same rate regardless of the mass or the shape. With that said, let's define our Julia function. The gravitational acceleration g depends on the location. For this example, let's set up a Pluto UI widget so we can select the value of g for Earth, Moon, or Mars. And by Moon, I mean Earth's Moon. I'm taking these values from the Wikipedia article on gravitational acceleration. There's a table in that article that contains the value of the gravitational acceleration for various bodies in our solar system. I'm using the values listed under the meters per second per second column. The reason why I'm using negative numbers is because I'm using the convention that up is a positive number, and down is a negative number. Let's bind a variable named select underscore g to a select widget. Now that we have our widget, let's set up an if statement to select the correct gravitational acceleration for the selected body. When you select a body, the value of g should change. Now that we've defined our function, let's assign values to our variables. du is the velocity in meters per second. All we need is an initial velocity. Let's use a slider so we can change this value later. For my US viewers, 100 meters per second is roughly 224 miles per hour. So that's really fast. Now, since we're launching an object into two-dimensional space, we need to do a little more work. We also need an angle between this initial velocity 
and the horizontal axis. Let's call this angle theta, and let's bind it to a slider as well. Now that we know the initial velocity and the angle above the horizontal axis, we need to break down the velocity into the horizontal component and the vertical component. We can use trigonometry to calculate the velocity in the horizontal direction, or Vx. By default, Julia calculates cosine and sine in radians. If you want to use degrees, you need to use the cosine d and sine d functions. Likewise, we can use trigonometry to calculate the velocity in the vertical direction, or vy. Now that we know the initial horizontal velocity and the initial vertical velocity, we can place those values inside of a vector, which we will use to express the initial velocity du underscore begin. Okay, let's move on to u. u is the position in meters. All we need for u is an initial position, but just like the velocity, we need an x value as well as a y value for the initial position. In this case, the value for both x and y is 0. Now that we know the initial positions for both x and y, we can place the values inside of a vector, which will express the initial position of u. Now what about the parameter p? Even though our Julia function takes the arguments the u, u, p, and t. For this example, there are no parameters in our equation, so we can skip assigning a value for p. But when it comes to t, we do need to assign values for t, which in this example is time in seconds. Let's bind the variable for the ending time to a slider that will give us a time span between 0 and 20 seconds. That may not sound like a lot of time, but We'll see later that 20 seconds is plenty of time to launch a projectile over a great distance. Now that we've assigned values to our variables, we can define the ODE problem. In this case, our problem is a second order ODE problem. The differential equations package provides a function appropriately named second order ODE problem. For this function, we need to include the initial value for the first derivative, du, in addition to the initial value of u. Now, the rest of the workflow to solve the problem and to plot the solution is the same as previous examples that you've seen. Let's take a look at the solution. Unlike previous examples that we've seen, this solution contains four columns of values, in addition to the column for the timestamps. The value 1 column contains values for the x components of du, or the first derivative. In this case, du is velocity, so this constant value of approximately 70 is the velocity in the horizontal direction. By convention, for horizontal movement, a positive number is motion to the right and a negative number is motion to the left. So our object is moving at a constant velocity of 70 meters per second to the right. The value 2 column contains values for the y component of du. So in this case, these values, starting at approximately 70, and then decreasing to approximately negative 125, are the velocities in the vertical direction. By convention for vertical movement, a positive number is motion going up, and a negative number is motion going down. So for this example, our object was initially moving up at 70 meters per second, and then at some point switched directions, and then started moving down. 20 seconds after launch, our object was moving down 
at a rate of 125 meters per second. The value 3 column contains values for the x component of u. In this case, u is position. So this column contains values for the horizontal position at any time t. So it looks like our object started at position 0, and then 20 seconds later, the object moved to a position 1,414 meters to the right of the original position. The value 4 column contains values for the y component of u. In other words, this column contains the values for the vertical position at any time t. So it looks like our object started at position 0, and then it started moving up. But at some point, it switched directions, so that 20 seconds after launch, the object moved to a position that is 547 meters below the original position. You can view the solution at any time t by using the variable named SOL, immediately followed by parentheses containing the time, and then followed by square brackets containing the index number for value 1, value 2, value 3, or value 4. Index 1 is for value 1, which is the velocity in the horizontal direction. Index 4 is for value 4, which is the position along the vertical axis. Although this may be helpful, it's still difficult to tell what's going on just by looking at this output. Let's plot the solution to see what it looks like. For this plot, let's include the legend. So this is different. What are we looking at here? These are the four columns of values, each plotted against time. You can toggle the individual plots on or off by clicking in the legend. So this line is the value 1 column, which shows a constant velocity in the horizontal direction. This line is the value 2 column, which shows the declining velocity in the vertical direction. Notice that it starts out as a positive number, and it ends up as a negative number. This line is the value 3 column, which shows the horizontal position at any time t. As you can see, it's constantly increasing. This curve is the value 4 column, which shows the vertical position at any time t. As you can see, it increases initially, and then at some point the values decrease due to gravity. At first glance, it may be tempting to think that this curve is the actual trajectory for our object. But remember, the x-axis here is showing time, and not the x-position. The y-axis here is also a little confusing, because this y-axis is for both velocity and for position. As a result, there are actually two different units of measure here. Meters per second for velocity, and meters for position. Let's add some attributes to our plot recipe to help clarify this plot. You can place the legend anywhere in the plot window by using a tuple containing x and y values for the bottom left corner of the legend. The x and y values are based on a 1x1 one one plot window, so the values in the tuple are not based on the values of your actual plot. You may need to play around with these values until you find a location for your legend that you like. Now that we have our plots, let's pull our widgets down so we can do some analysis. I'm going to fast forward through this part. Next, let's add some markdown so we can see the values for the x position, the y position, the x velocity, and the y velocity at any time t. I'm starting to run out of space in this notebook. 
So I'm going to display all of this markdown text on one line. Now that everything's in place, let's have some fun. As you move the slider four seconds, you can see the plot and the values update for any time t. You can also change the values for the initial velocity. You can also change the value for the initial angle in degrees. So those are the values for Earth. You can select a different body by using the drop-down menu. As you can see, the plots look very different for the Moon. Mars also looks very different. While this plot may be interesting, the plot that you're probably interested in is the actual trajectory of the object along the x and y axis, right? Let's create a new plot showing the actual trajectory. In the plots package, you can select which index number to plot by using the IDXS attribute, short for indices, along with the tuple containing the index numbers. In our case, we want to plot values 3 and values 4, since they contain the values for the x position and the y position. So this plot shows the actual trajectory for the launched object. You can move all of the sliders and change the location just like before. So this plot is showing the object going up initially, and at some point, it begins to move down due to gravity. Around the 1000 meter mark, the object begins moving down below zero in the vertical direction. Obviously, if there is a ground at zero, then the object would stop when y equals zero. But if the object was launched from the edge of a cliff, then of course, the object would continue to fall until it hits some surface below it. If you move the slider for seconds, you can see the value at any time t. If you move the slider for initial velocity, you can see the impact on the trajectory. If you move the slider for angle in degrees, you can see the impact on the trajectory. When the angle is 90 degrees, then the object is just going straight up and then straight down. Try moving the second slider until the Y position is close to zero. At that time, the X position is roughly 1000 meters, or one kilometer. For my US viewers, one kilometer is a little more than half a mile. So that's pretty far to travel in like 14 seconds. So these are values on Earth. Let's change the location to the moon to see the impact. As you can see, an object launched on the moon with the same initial settings will travel off of this chart due to the impact of gravity, or lack thereof. You can play with the values for the initial velocity and angle to get a trajectory that is within the range of this plot. So based on this model, you can get an object to roughly the same location within 20 seconds using an initial velocity of only 50 meters per second 
and using an angle of only 19 degrees. Let's change the location to Mars to see what it's like over there. So the gravity on Mars is somewhere between the Earth and the Moon. Again, you can play with the values for the initial velocity and angle to get a trajectory that's within the range of this plot. So on Mars, you can launch an object to a similar location within 20 seconds by using an initial velocity of 63 meters per second and using an angle of 36 degrees. Feel free to plug in gravitational acceleration values from other planets to see how the values change. Fascinating, right? Let's take another look at our second order differential equation. It's really amazing how much knowledge can be harvested from such a simple looking equation. The power of the second order differential equation is that it packs in all of the knowledge from the first derivative in addition to all of the knowledge from the second derivative. Hmm. I know that we covered a lot today, so let's stop here and recap what we just learned. In order to solve second order ordinary differential equation problems in Julia using the differential equations.jl package, you need to set up your Julia function with four arguments for du, u, p, and t. du is the first derivative of the unknown function u. When setting up your variables, you need to include an initial value for du in addition to the initial value for u. When defining the problem, you need to use the second order ODE problem function. In that function, you need to include an argument for the initial value for du in addition to the initial value for u. The solution will contain multiple columns containing values for du and for u. By default, plotting the solution will plot all of the values. You can select which columns you want to plot by using the idxs attribute along with the tuple containing the index numbers for the columns that you want to plot. Once you master this workflow, you'll be able to solve all sorts of interesting second order ordinary differential equations. I don't think it's possible to overstate how incredible this is. You can do everything that I did in this tutorial without using differential equations, but it will take a lot more time and a lot more code. With the differential equations.jl package, all you need to do is pump it through the solver and then the solver does all of the heavy lifting for you. As a result, you can spend less time writing code and more time performing analysis. And that is time well spent. If you made it this far, congratulations. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, then please consider smashing that like button leaving a comment, sharing this video, and subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support the educational work that I'm doing, please consider making a purchase at the doggo.jl online store. You can browse through a wide selection of doggo.jl merch by clicking on the store tab. For one-time donations, please consider using the Super Thanks button. For ongoing support, please consider joining and becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to all of my new videos. Early access videos do not contain YouTube ads. New tutorials are posted on Sundays slash Mondays. Thanks for watching and good luck on your Julia journey.